progress. Okay, let's begin with a word of prayer. Dear Father in heaven, we invite your presence once again as we open your word. I pray that you can guide this study, help me in the, the choices and the decisions, the words that I use. Help me to speak clearly, give me a clear mind. Give us all an open heart to hear you speaking to us. Help us to understand these things at this time. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> well, good evening. Happy Sabbath again, everyone. And this is a continuation of a study. So I've been, we've been doing a study every Friday um, for quite a long time here. And the study on the sanctuary is, is rather involved in that it's not a typical study on the sanctuary. That is, we're looking at from Eden lost to Eden restored. And the basic, um, I guess, the basic premise that we get when we start in the book of Genesis is that there are these threads these threads that run through scripture. And that's really what we're looking at. Now, we started at the book of Genesis and we're ending with the book of Revelation. We, we didn't study everything. There's lots of things we could have studied. We focused mostly first on Genesis, the stories in Genesis, uh, the promise of the covenants, the seed of the woman, uh, the first gospel promise in Genesis chapter three, that he would bruise the serpent's head and the serpent would bruise his heel. The origin of sin, of course, and and then all of these different stories in Genesis that illustrate uh, the everlasting gospel, which is uh, a message, a three-step testing prophetic message that prepares and demonstrates two classes of workers. And um, we looked at the Exodus. And there was lots of things there in the Exodus. We looked at um, the covenant that was made with the Israelites, the old covenant, and how it differed from the covenant made with Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and Noah and all these different people throughout Scripture, how it differed from the everlasting covenant made in the Garden of Eden. And, and we learned some things. Um, a one thing that we really... Uh, came to understand, and this was sort of tied to our study of the book of Hebrews as well, is that the covenant that was made with ancient Israel, when they said, all the Lord has said, we will do and be obedient, was first made prior to the giving of the law. Then the law was given, and they again made that covenant. But that covenant they break, and God had to establish a new covenant with them. And it was based upon lots of different things. Um, you know, Moses won with the heart of Christ, saying, blot my name out of the book of life. So, so we know that, that this sanctuary message that was given to Seventh-day Adventists is not about the building. I, you know, my grandfather, who was a, a Methodist minister, he collected old religious books, and he had lots of books on the sanctuary. But, you know, I read the books. And they talk about the building and how it was constructed and, and, you know, and how the service was conducted in the sanctuary and so forth. And, you know, I read um, the temple ministry and its services as they were in the time of Christ by Alfred Edersheim. And, you know, and again, he describes these things. But Adventism has a message that reaches to the depths of the symbolism of the sanctuary. And, and we looked at those things. We looked at in Exodus, we looked at the various furniture. And we didn't go into it in real depth. And we looked at the offerings a bit, and we looked at the Day of Atonement a bit. But what we have is um, this, this message of the sanctuary for Seventh-day Adventists is tied up with our lives. It's tied up with our experience of sin, righteousness, and judgment. 
of justification, sanctification, of glorification. And so this thread we find, of course, in the book of Revelation. Now, often the way that I approached it always in the past is I would study the book of Leviticus, and I would study that in connection with the book of Hebrews. I would have the one book from the Old Testament and the one from the New, the New explaining the types and the differences between the covenant made with ancient Israel and the covenant that was made with Abraham, that, that is the everlasting covenant that was made with Adam and Eve. And then I would also look at the book of Daniel and the book of Revelation. So the book of Daniel, does it address the sanctuary? Is the book of Daniel about the sanctuary? Many aspects of it, yes. Many aspects of it are. So, so we know it's about this captivity, but we know that that the book of Daniel is going to deal with, especially when you get to the end of it, the rebuilding of the temple and prophecies about Christ. That is, Daniel chapter 9, verse 24 to 27, is definitely about the sanctuary. And it's about Christ, his covenant that he's going to make in the midst of the week, and how it's going to replace the covenant that was done with the original temple. That temple is going to be destroyed. The city and the sanctuary are going to be destroyed. But there is a new covenant. He, he confirms that covenant with many for one week. So, so the book of Daniel addresses the sanctuary. Now, does the book of Revelation address the sanctuary? Definitely. Yes. So it takes – the book of Revelation is such a profound book because – most of it is just references to the Old Testament. There's very little in the book of Revelation that we would call original. I can't remember the number of how many verses that it references, but it's a great deal number of verses. Now, so this study here, and, and, it, and it's going to be this, this tonight, and then next Friday I'm going to sum it up. So I won't get through the book of Revelation in one study, I'll have to do it in two. But it's just the sanctuary aspects of it. And we've touched on these before because when we were in Genesis, we kept looking at Re Revelation because we could understand what we were reading in Genesis because of our understanding of the book of Revelation. But we're going to go through this now. And, you know, obviously... I'm going to have to simplify things. I'm going to just have to highlight some of these details. And one of the things we know about the book of Revelation is it's a revelation of Jesus Christ. Now, how would we describe that in the context of this message? What, if, what, what word have we used to describe this revelation of Jesus Christ? We found it in the book of Daniel and other places. Is it the moire, whichever word it is, the feminine form of the word mara, mar, a vision, the looking glass vision? Yes. Yeah. So that's a revelation of Jesus Christ. And remember, 2 Corinthians chapter 3, it's the law of liberty. And we're changed into the same image from glory to glory. And in the book of James... It's the law that if we look into it, if we are not changed by it, we just forget what manner of man we are. We, we can't do that. We have to look into this law of liberty. It is the law of liberty. But in it, we have to see Christ. Now, does Christ condemn us? I know it's a no. question. Okay, he doesn't, right? Because he died for us. But if we looked into the law without Christ, are we condemned? Yes. Yeah. So, so we need Christ. It has to be a revelation of Jesus Christ, it's not just the law written and engraven on stones, which was glorious, which glory is to be done away, but the law written and engraven in the heart. And that's, 
That's the heart of the gospel. Is Christ character? Is the mystery of godliness? Godliness, right? Christ in humanity, not just as the man Jesus Christ, but Christ in each one of you. That's the mystery of godliness. Christ in you, the hope of glory. So this revelation of Jesus Christ is going to be manifested in all these symbols from the Old Testament. But what we're going to be focusing upon is the sanctuary symbolism. So for some of you, this is review in that we've, we've addressed these things at other times in other studies. But Christ is first seen in Revelation chapter 1. Standing in the midst of the golden candlesticks. But there's all of these references, John to the seven churches which are in Asia, grace unto you, peace from him which was, which is, which was, and which is to come. So that's the past, the present, the future. We're going to see that the beast which was, which is not, and yet is, that's a counterfeit of Christ. It's an antichrist. And from the seven spirits which are before his throne, and from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness, and the first begotten of the dead, the prince of the kings of the earth, and the prince of the kings of the earth, unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood, and hath made us kings and priests unto God and his father. Doesn't, didn't Moses say he, that, or, that God said he wanted to have a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. And it's in Christ that that is realized. Behold, he cometh with clouds, every eye shall see him. And he says, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the ending, saith the Lord, which is and which was and which is to come, the Almighty. Now, Jehovah's Witnesses, when they look at this verse, um, in Jehovah's Witnesses' Bible, um, do they have the word Jehovah in the New Testament when it's quoting the Old Testament? Does anybody know about that? So every time in the Old Testament when it says, you know, Jehovah, they just write Jehovah. They don't put Lord, right? Jehovah's Witnesses Bible. But do they do that in the New Testament? I don't believe so. They do. Eight no, times. no, they yeah, don't. Eight so times. Do they? Eight times in the New Testament, they have the name Jehovah oh, really? when they're quoting the Old Testament. Okay. Yes, when because in the Old, Old Testament, Testament, their Bible, it's all translated to Jehovah. Right. So when it says, and, yeah. Now, the, the, the King James translators, when they translated um, the Old Testament, they sometimes used L-O-R-D, capitalized, you know, small capitals. Um but in the New Testament, uh, the New Testament writers never wrote the word Jehovah when they quoted the Old Testament. They always used the Greek word Kyrios, which means Lord. And that's why the New Test that's why the King James translators, when they translated the Old Testament, they chose mostly to use the English word Lord from the example of the New Testament writers. Now, the Jehovah's Witnesses chose eight places where when it was quoting from an Old Testament verse that was referring to Jehovah, they translated as Jehovah. But in this verse here, Revelation 1, verse 8, notice it has the word Lord, but the Jehovah's Witness Bible does not put the word Jehovah here. They just put Lord. And why would they do that? Why do Jehovah's Witnesses not translate this as Jehovah? Don't they accept Jehovah as being the Father and not the Son? Right. And this is pretty clear that this is the Son. But right. the Jehovah of the Old Testament and Christ are the same party. Right. So Jehovah refers to the Son most of the time when it's used in the Bible. 
But we can see that this is actually quoting from the Old Testament where it's talking about Jehovah. And if you look there, you'll see in the context, it actually is talking about Jehovah. But here we know that it has to be Christ speaking. I'm the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the ending, said the Lord, which was and which is to come, the Almighty. I, John, who am also your brother, companion in tribulation in the kingdom and patience of Jesus Christ, was in the isle that is called Patmos from the word of God and for the testimony of Jesus Christ. I was in the spirit on the Lord's day and heard behind me a great voice as a trumpet saying, I am Alpha and Omega, the first and the last. And, and we can see then that this is Christ. Now, he's going to be standing in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks. Now, this is, in my understanding, this is just the branched menorah. It's not seven separate candlesticks um, with each with their own base. But this is the sanctuary in heaven, and it's symbolizing the seven churches. And, and we see that, you know, he's the son of man, right? That's the one who spoke. And it describes him in, 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 in the same way that we will see uh, him described in the Old Testament in other places, when it's clear that it's Jehovah or the angel of the Lord, however you want to look at it. Now, he goes on and talks about that he's the first and the last. I'm he that liveth and was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore. I have the keys of hell and death. And... And there's lots of symbolism, lots of things that I wish I could just talk on, but I would have to talk too long. But the mystery of the seven stars which thou sawest in my right hand and the seven golden candlesticks, the seven stars are the angels of the seven churches and the seven candlesticks which thou sawest are the seven churches. And then the message is given to the seven churches. And we know that these go and they span from the time of Christ up until the second coming and that this is a prophecy regarding the true church of God even though it has faults with it all of the churches have faults except which church which church does not receive a rebuke church of brotherly love yeah. Philadelphia Philadelphia does not receive a rebuke and, and there's some interesting things about the structure when you, when you, I don't know why I went to Revelation 10. Um, so when you look at these church and you look at the structures of these, you got the angel of the church of Ephesus. And it's going to give uh, something about it. And then I say, I know thy works, thy labor, thy patience. So it's going to give them a commendation. And then I have somewhat against thee. It's going to give a rebuke. Thou hast lost thy first love, hast left thy first love. Um, he that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. So this form or structure, and you're going to see that the first four churches all have this same structure. So then you get to the first, the, the church of Thyatira. And this is the period of the, the 1260 years. Now some people divide it differently, uh, but I say that Thyatira is the period of papal persecution from 538 to 1798. Um, and it's going to still have the same form, but when you get to these other ones, uh, the form changes a little bit. So I'm not going to go into details and show you this here. Um, but it's going to give the sort of the rebuke first. It kind of gives some counsel. Um, um, and then it's going to do, um, yeah, and then it's going to give – I have a few names in Sardis. Now, Philadelphia doesn't get a rebuke at all. Um, but these are these church ages, so we're all familiar with this idea. And the church of Laodicea is the time period that we're in. Now, all of these things do repeat. That is, we spend some time looking at these messages. And we can see that they have a historical fulfillment, but we can see also that they have an application. All of them have an application to this time. That is, all of these churches exist in our time. Would we agree with that?
Now, did these churches exist in Christ's time? I would think not. Okay, well, well, the the literal churches did exist, though. Um, I can't remember which church it is, but one of them, actually, at the time this letter uh, was written, I mean, all of these churches existed. Um, but some of these things are still prophetic. That is, they don't really apply yet until later, uh, even for the literal churches. So they are prophecies about those literal churches. But they also have an application throughout history. And they also have an application to our time. Are, are we going to have the Church of Philadelphia in our time? Is, is Millerite history going to be repeated? And Miller, yeah, that was, I was just going to say Millerite history is going to be repeated. So it has to be, uh, right. that church has to be in existence again. Yeah. And we can also see that if we look at Adventist history, we could take this history of the Christian church and could we apply it to the four generations? Can we take the four generations of Adventism and see them line up with Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamon, Pergamon and Thyatira? Well, now that you mention it, yes. Okay. So the four generations of Adventism lead us to that. And then because there is a time at the end, right? So just like we can take Sardis and Philadelphia, because Sardis is the period of the first angel's message, Philadelphia is the period of the second angel's message, and Laodicea is the period after that. But we can take the four generations of Adventism, and we can line those up. But we can also take Sardis and Philadelphia and place them in our history as well. <coughs> now, this repeat of these messages shouldn't be seen as a rejection of prophetic fulfillment. That is, we can see that there's just a repeat of history. Ellen White says this about the book of the da book of Daniel. You know, the history connected with this prophecy will be repeated. And we can see that that happens again. History is being repeated. Now, exactly how we do that and how we understand it, I mean, that's, that's a study that takes time, and we're not going to go through that. And... And, and obviously, as we go through history, we start to understand these things in clearer ways. Now, the second line of prophecy in the book of Revelation also brings us to the sanctuary. And that's the throne in heaven. And I looked and behold, a door was opened in heaven. Now, who opened that door? Christ. Okay. And on what basis did he open that door? Uh, he opened it. Let's see. Okay. So one thing we can see, if we look at the Church of Philadelphia, um, and it says right in verse, uh, chapter 3, verse 7, To the angel of the church in Philadelphia write, These things saith he that is holy, he that is true, he that hath the key of David, he that openeth and no man shutteth, and shutteth and no man openeth. That's a qu quotation from Isaiah 22, 22. Um, so in Isaiah 22, and we did a study on this when I was doing the book of Hebrews. Um but it says, and the key of the house of David will I lay upon his shoulder, and he shall open, and none shall shut, and he shall shut, and none shall open. And I will fasten him as a nail in a sure place, which I take this verse and apply it to the anchor, uh, sure and steadfast, right? So that's, that's in the holy place of the heavenly sanctuary. So when we, we look at, at, at the message here in Revelation 3, we can see that this is the Church of Philadelphia. And it's under the Church of Philadelphia that what door is opened? It's the door to the most holy place, correct? Correct. And what door is shut? Agree. Go ahead. 
the door into the holy place. place. Yeah. So the door to the holy place is shut. The door to the most holy is open. But in chapter four here, when we see this door open, which door is this? Some people give various answers to this. But wouldn't this be the door to the holy place when Christ begins his heavenly ministry? That could be. Yeah. Ellen White's clear this is his inauguration. This is the beginning of his ministry in heaven. This is what John is shown in vision. The Church of Philadelphia is going to experience the end of that heaven, that ministry in the holy place. But here we're going to see it set up. So he sees this throne, and, and we've gone through a study of this before. Most people just assume that this is the Father. But Ellen White's quite clear that this is the Son, who has the rainbow above his head. He points to the rainbow above his own head. And, and when I first realized this, was I was probably 23 years old, uh, studying just with the, the blue indexes. I didn't have the, the CD-ROM back then. We didn't have computers. And, and just studying diligently came to understand this. So studying the book of Revelation using the spirit of prophecy. Um, a lot of times I didn't have the books, but the indexes have enough verses sometimes you can, you can figure out what they're talking about. But I, I did find the books with the quotes in them. Um, now we have these four and 20 elders seated upon around the throne. And we know that it's before the, the seven lamps of fire burning before the throne. So this is in the holy place. And then we also, before the throne, there's a sea of glass. And we mostly just think of it as a body of water. But, but it's a sea of gra glass, like the brazen sea in Solomon's temple. It's a laver. Now, it's a pretty big laver because there's going to be 144,000 standing on it. But it's, it's still a representation of the laver, which is outside the holy place. So when the door is opened, this must be the door to the holy place. Because you wouldn't say that the laver is before the throne if you're talking about the most holy place, correct? Right. Mm -hmm. So Christ now is in the holy place, beginning his ministry. He's on his throne. And so we're in the holy place of the heavenly sanctuary. Many Christians who study the book of Revelation have no idea what kind of symbolism they're seeing here. And we also have this, this beast, which we see in Ezekiel, the, the four beasts, the one with it um, that was like a lion, the second like a calf, the third with the face of the man. The fourth beast was like a flying eagle. And in the book of Ezekiel, we can see this was a representation of the zodiac, but also the four directions of the compass and of certain of the tribes, so lion, Judah, the calf, which is the calf, anybody remember? The ox, Who, which tribe was that? Anybody remember? The face of a man and the eagle. Which tribes are these? <clears throat> we studied this in Ezekiel. I know not all of you did, but... <clears throat> Okay, if we're going to look at the constellations, what constellations would these, these be? Which constellation is the lion? Judah. Okay, well, Judah is the tribe, but that would be Leo, right? Leo. Right. Right. And, Judah, Judah is the lion. Yeah, Judah is the lion, right? And then we have the calf. So what constellation is that? 
it, it's Horus. Not, it's Horus, right? The bull. Okay. Uh, the man. Um. Orion? No, yeah, Orion was wasn't he the archer or something like that? Yeah, this this is Aquarius. Aquarius. And the flying eagle, which is also uh, represented as a serpent, in uh, with the tribes, but. Hmm. Oh, drawing a blank. Wouldn't that be Dan? Okay, but you're you're going to the tribes. So, which constellation is this? referring to because because we don't normally think of this constellation as, as being the eagle so draw on a blank okay and I'm trying to remember myself, so I shouldn't be too hard on you. But it is um, – uh, it's going to be the, the four directions. So it is um, – it's represented by um, – Pretty sure it's the the scorpion, but anyway, I'll have to come back to that. I can't remember offhand. I, I could have had the notes here, um, but anyway, these represent the constellations. I can't remember which ones, but Reuben is the man. The calf, which is Taurus, which is the ox. And then we have this flying eagle, which is also represented, I believe, of the scorpion um, or the or the serpent. But I, I can't remember which tribes go to which one. I do know Reuben's the man, I believe. No, that's not true. Here, I'm going to look this up. I should remember these things, shouldn't I? These are the standards, right? So they have these standards um, of the different thing, uh, different. Uh, so you're going to have ox. Okay, Judah is your lion. Yeah, Judah is a lion. Issachar is a donkey. Zebulun is more of a ship. Yeah. Tribe of Levi. <clears throat> I just don't I don't know how to um, explain that one on their on their standard. Okay. Okay, we'll keep going. Reuben is more like water. Okay, but as far as the standard is concerned, I believe that Reuben was the man. The face of very the man. Well okay. Okay, Simeon on the standard, wouldn't that be swords? Yeah, so, yeah. You know, we really should be able to remember memorize these things. Um, Ephraim is the bull. Yeah, Ephraim's the, the bull. Reuben, I'm pretty sure, is the man. Okay, so okay, so I'm I'm just looking here at another place. Um, Benjamin is the wolf. What's that? Benjamin is the wolf. Yeah. Rabbi, a predatory wolf. Yeah. Dan is the serpent. Right. He's the um, that bites at the horse's heels. He's the backbiter. And it's also the eagle as well. Okay. 
Right. So, so he's connected Nafti, to that. Naphtali would be the hind. Yeah. I just don't know how to explain Asher. Okay. But the four that we need are the main four that in the way that the, the camp was set up. So you had Judah to the north, Dan to the west, Ephraim to the south, and um, no, yeah, you had Judah to the east, Dan to the north, Ephraim to the west, and Reuben to the south. And they were respectively a lion, an eagle, an ox, and a man. So the lion's Judah, the eagle is Dan, which is also the serpent, uh, the ox is Ephraim, and Reuben is the man. Okay. So this is, I mean, this is kind of a tradition. So it's not like we have it explicitly stated in the Bible, but it would be understood by um, the Bible writers, what is being referred to. And we saw that in the book of Ezekiel. So sorry that I took so long to deal with that part. Now, the reason why I bring this up, why this is important is this is from the book of Ezekiel. And, and what is the book of Ezekiel about? When we studied it, what did we find that Ezekiel was doing when he was in vision? What did he see, especially when you get to chapter 8 and chapter 9 and onwards? You see something happening, chapter 1 as well. Uh, the destruction of Jerusalem. Okay, it's about the destruction of Jerusalem. But he's he's dealing with the temple. Right. Right. OK, so there's all these things that happen at the temple and we dealt with uh, the movement of the glory of the Lord through the temple. And we saw it had all kinds of symbolic representations. And then we also see, of course, in Ezekiel chapter 40 to the end in this what we call Ezekiel's temple. And so Ezekiel's temple is about this temple as well. But it's, it's not talking about some temple that's going to be rebuilt in the future by literal Jews. It's talking about a symbolic temple. And that in Ezekiel, all of this, the beasts, the temple, all of these represent time or time prophecies. That is, the measurements of the temple represent time prophecies. And even, even the zodiac which is the sky, which the Babylonians worshipped and which the Jews were worshipping, God is going to use this against them. The sky becomes a witness against them because God is in control of the sky. He's the one who made the sun and the moon and the stars. The gods, the stars are not gods. The sun and the moon are not gods. They're created by God. And they're given for times, for seasons, for days, and for years. And they're going to be a witness against God's people. So all of the time prophecies in Ezekiel are tied up with the, with the very beginning when you have Ezekiel's wheels within wheels, this confusion that is in perfect order. So why do we have this representation here in the book of Revelation? Is time being introduced in the book of Revelation? Well, we know it is in the book of Revelation. Yeah. I mean, it's maybe not introduced, but it's going to refer back to time prophecies of the past. Yes. Right. And the book of Ezekiel, when you look at chapter 4, 5, and 6, especially 5 and 6, it's quoting from Leviticus 26. There are all these references to Leviticus 26 which is where we get these time prophecies from. It is the 2300 days, the 70 weeks, even Revelation chapter nine is based upon Leviticus 26. That's what so study the, tells us. Yeah. So, so God is giving us these symbols to bring us back to the past, to look at the prophecies of the Old Testament. And only when we understand the prophecies of the Old Testament can we understand the prophecies in the book of Revelation? I remember the first time I seriously read the book of Revelation. I was uh, 14 years old. And um, there was this um, book, a booklet that my brother had. And it was about the book of Revelation. It was really scary. I mean, 
uh, because they took everything literally. And, and back then, before I was converted, I mean, uh, I was sort of scared of Satan for some reason. He only has the power of deception, but, you know, I was a naive child still. But as I prayed to God, I wanted to understand the book of Revelation because I read the book itself and I realized that it's an open book and that blessed are they that read and understand the things that are written therein. That we have to heed what's written in the book of Revelation and we can't add to it. And we can't take away from it. So here we have this, these time prophecies that are going to be introduced. And these time prophecies are connected to the sanctuary in the book of Revelation, are they not? Yes. Yes. So it's very, very clear that the book of Revelation is about time and that they're, they're all tied to these symbols in the book of Revelation. Now, Revelation chapter 4, you're going to have this book which is contained in symbolic language, the history of the world. And it's, it's in part the book of Daniel. And it's going to be seen in the right hand of him that sat upon the throne. And it's going to be written within and on the backside. And it's sealed with seven seals. But Christ seated upon the throne cannot open the book. But then we're going to see the line of the tribe of Judah, the root of David. And he's going to appear as a lamb slain with seven horns and seven eyes. And he can open the book. So, And he's going to take the book out of his out of the right hand of him that sat upon the throne so so some people think well it must be the one on the throne must be the father and the but we can see that this is symbolic language isn't it that's what it appears to be so can christ seated upon the throne in heaven can he open the little book yes no he can't only the lamb slain with seven horns and seven eyes can open the little book. That is, Christ seated upon the throne, he can't open the book because how does he unseal the book of Daniel? Mm. Doesn't he take upon himself our nature, come and die in the midst of the week? We have a progression again. <laughs> yeah. So without Christ dying, without him being the lamb slain, he can't open the little book. So he has to do that. So when he takes that book out of the right hand of, of him that sat upon the throne, he's really taking the book from himself. But it's two different representations of himself. One as a king on the throne, the other one as the lamb slain. And, and that, marks, that marks a timing, does it not? Yes, it marks a timing. So, so in order to do that, this is referring us back to Christ taking on him his, upon himself human nature and particularly our sins, dying for our sins. So there's always this reference back and forth in the book of Revelation. It's not a chronological book starting from the beginning and going to the end. No. It keeps referencing back. And so Christ has to, he can open this book. So that's Revelation chapter 5. That's the message of the seven seals. Right? But then the seven, so the seven seals are now going to open. And how are they opened? One at a time. <laughs> One at a time. And they're opened historically. So we're going to see. You know, Christ is the one that opens him because he opens them because he comes and dies upon the cross. He fulfills prophecy and that opens up the first seal. And that first seal is going to be the early church. Mm. Right. It's on a white horse. It has a bow and a crown was given unto him and he went forth conquering and to conquer. That's the early church. But then we have the second seal. And that's going to be persecution. And we have the third seal, and this is going to be more persecution, but worse persecution. And then we have the fourth seal. And again, it's increasing in intensity, just like the four seven times. And I looked and behold, a pale horse and his name that sat on him was death and hell followed him. 
This is the period of the papacy. Mm -hmm. So we can see that the church, even though it comes with this promise, it's going to experience this persecution. And really what they're experiencing and what we're experiencing is when we go through this is the cross of Christ in history. When he had opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of them that were slain for the word of God. This is the end of the 1260. Now, we're also introduced to a new part of the heavenly sanctuary. This is the altar of burnt offering where they pour out the blood. Right? So we had studied that. And, and of course, they want their blood avenged. Their blood is what cries out from the ground, just like uh, Abel's blood cried from the ground. Mm-hmm. Right? Right. Now, we, we ran into some interesting things as we went through this, because we know that the sixth seal begins with the Earth, Lisbon earthquake, because this is, is ending this period of papal persecution. And then the sun became black as sackcloth of hair and the moon became as blood. That's the dark day. And then the stars from fell from heaven. So the dark day in, in, in 1780 and then the stars falling from heaven in 1833. And, and I had in my Bible written between verse 13 and 14, you are here. But we came to understand that, that the sixth seal ends when because people read this and they say well this is the second coming of christ did the millerites proclaim the second coming of christ yes they did yeah and and this is describing that proclamation that for the great day of his wrath is come and who shall be able to stand and then what we see in chapter 7 is this parent this answer to this question uh, between the sixth and seventh seal, which is the hundred and forty four thousand? That's who's going to be able to stand, and we're going to see that it's the twelve tribes of Israel, but not the literal twelve tribes, because Dan isn't there. He's a backbiter. He's the serpent, and then we see that. Um, Levi is included, and Levi is not normally included in the 12 tribes because they're scattered among the other tribes. But we can see that Joseph is there, though not named Ephraim. So Joseph, Ephraim would normally be how you would refer to that tribe, but it's the tribe of Joseph. And also Benjamin is there. So Joseph has the double portion. So this is not literal Jews that are being referenced here. Plus, we have no idea who the literal Jews are. All the tribes are scattered, never to be gathered. And, and of course, the literal Jews, probation closed for the Jewish nation in 34 AD, and it was executed in 70 AD with the destruction of the temple. And then we see the great multitude. They come from all, that's the work and the accomplishment of the 144,000 which would include many people who are resurrected who have died in the past. And then we have chapter eight and chapter eight is going to start again with another piece of furniture, which is the altar having a golden censer. So where is this located? Where is this altar located? The, the Holy of Holies, isn't it? Okay, so if you read in Hebrews chapter 9, it will say that it belongs to the most holy place, that is the Hagia to Hagion, that is the Holy of Holies, or in, in Hebrew it would be Kodesh HaKodeshim, so it would be the Holy of Holies. But it actually stood in the holy place. Now, when Adventists read this, this is the opening of the seventh seal. Now, I argue that the sixth seal ends October 22nd, 1844. And when is the seventh seal open then? Wouldn't it be October 22nd, 1844? Okay. 
Now, there is an apocryphal interpretation where Ellen White talks about we were seven days ascending to the sea of glass. And somehow we attached that to the silence in heaven for about the space of half an hour. Half an hour in prophetic time would be seven and a half days. And so people put these together and say, well, that's when the seventh seal is opened is when we go up to heaven. That's the second coming because the sixth seal in chapter six, it talks about the second coming. But we, we've can't come to accept the idea that Revelation 8 is referring to the seventh seal opened on the day of atonement and that the silence in heaven is not heaven being emptied from angels, but it's the day of atonement silence. And what's the day of atonement silence? What are we listening for? The voice of God. Yeah, we're going to listen to the voice of God. We'll hear the voice of God at some point, but aren't we listening to the to the bells on the garment on the border of oh, the, the garment, tinkling the priest? Yeah, the as tinkling. he ministers yeah. in the heavenly in, in the heavenly sanctuary in the most holy place, aren't we yeah. following Christ? Yes. Yeah. So that's what the silence in heaven is. That's the day of atonement, and we know that. When he goes to the most holy place, isn't it the language of the second coming in the Old Testament? Don't we see that in the book of Daniel? Well, yes. And we read that as, as Christ going into the most holy place. We don't read it as the second coming. So my suggestion is that Revelation chapter 6, even though it ends with the symbols of the second coming, that that's Millerite history. That's the message that's being proclaimed. And that it's not, verse 14 is not the second coming in verse 13, uh, 1833. It continues, verse 13 is 1833, but it continues on to describe that history. And then it describes 144,000. Who's going to be able to stand? And then it gives us the seventh seal, which is the beginning of the judgment. And then we're going to have with the seventh seal a new line of prophecy. So we had we had the the churches and we had the seals, and now we're going to have the seven trumpets. Now the seventh trumpets don't begin in the time of Christ, because these are judgments against first pagan Rome, then papal Rome, and then finally modern Rome. So we spent a lot of time going through this, but the angel here. This is another angel come and stood at the altar. So there's seven angels with seven trumpets, and this other angel comes, and he has a golden censer. And this, of course, is Christ, that he should offer it with the prayers of all saints upon the golden altar, which was before the throne. And the smoke of the incense, which came with the prayers of the saints, ascended up before God out of the angel's hand. And the angel took the censer and filled it with fire of the altar and cast it into the earth. <coughs> And there were voices and thunderings and lightnings and an earthquake. Now, these are the judgments against <coughs> pagan Rome. Now, the problem that we have is that most Adventists, most modern Adventist scholarship, when they look at this, they say this is the close of probation. Now, why would they do that? Why do they want to see this as the close of probation when he casts down the censor? And, th and this is common, too, with a lot of uh, conservative Adventists, not just modern scholarship. It was a common interpretation in the 1980s and 90s. Is it typifying a close of probation? Does what happened to pagan Rome and to papal Rome typify a close of probation? I don't want it to be like a trick question or anything. Didn't we determine that uh, papal Rome at the end of, uh, I'm sorry, at the end of pagan Rome, that was exactly that what you just asked mm -hmm. it was a, a 
sign per se? Yeah. Now, one of the things we're going to see, and especially with papal Rome, um, that we have these seven trumpets. And of course, we know that the seven trumpets, the first four deal, deal with the judgment against pagan Rome. And, and then we're going to have this message of the fifth and the sixth trumpet. And they're going to deal with the judgments against papal Rome. And, and we understand the prophecy of, of Josiah Lynch. We can, we can look at it. We can see that Islam comes against, uh, not papal Rome, Eastern Rome, I meant. So we got pagan Rome, or, or I shouldn't say pagan Rome. I should have said Western Rome and Eastern Rome. Okay, so we got Western Rome. That's the judgments, which we would actually call papal Rome. Uh, but it is also the fall of the Roman Empire leading to what becomes papal Rome. So in order for Papal Rome to rise, you have to have the Western Roman Empire fall, right? So it is pagan Rome leading to Papal Rome. That's the first four trumpets. Then we have the fifth and sixth trumpet, and they're going to deal with Islam, and that's going to be judgments against Eastern Rome. Now, we know that the Millerites expected what to happen at the end of the second woe. What did they expect to happen Besides the fall of Turkey. Anybody remember or anybody? Could you ask your question again? So the question is, what did the Millerites expect to happen? Josiah Litch, um, um, William Miller and uh, who's the other one? Um, Joshua V. Himes. They all expected the same thing to happen at the end of the second woe. And what was it they expected? They knew Turkey would fall, but what else would, would happen in association with it? it? So the end of the second woe is the end of the sixth trumpet. And so what did they expect the end of the sixth trumpet to be? A restraint. Okay. So it wasn't so much a restraint. They were looking for a close of probation. That is, they took the language from the Bible where it says, um, Oh yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. So where is it here? Um, I think it might be. Yeah, it's going to be when you get to the – over here to the the seventh trumpet. So when they get to the seventh trumpet – so they believe that the sixth trumpet ends with the second woe. It doesn't. It ends on October 22nd, 1844, and the seventh trumpet begins to sound then. But they thought that the seventh trumpet has to happen before Jesus comes back, and so the seventh trumpet must begin to sound shortly after the sixth trumpet ends. So they were expecting a close of probation. <clears throat> and the seventh angel sounded, and there were great voices in heaven, saying, The kingdoms of this world are become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. Now we know in Revelation eleven nineteen, And the temple of God was opened in heaven, and there was seen in his temple the ark of his testament, and there were lightnings and voices and thunderings and an earthquake and great hail. So this brings us back to um, this symbolism dealing with the second coming, with the giving of the law. And, and this is about, about October 22nd, 1844. That's when the temple of God was opened in heaven. And we're going to see the Ark of his Testament. So as Seventh-day Adventists, we know that the seventh trumpet began to sound October 22nd, 1844, if we know Millerite history and what Ellen White says about it. So, so they, they expected that would be the second coming, connected with this close of probation. So that's what they were expecting when the sixth trumpet ended, that the seventh trumpet would sound and probation would be closed. And, and they were expecting there to be a period of time from the close of probation to the second coming of Christ. Later on, they abandoned that view as they approached 1844. But back in 1840, they, they were expecting a close of probation. 
It seems kind of odd to us now. But if you think about what do we think about when Jesus is going to come back? Do we believe there's going to be a close of probation and then there's going to be a period of time before he returns? Yeah, so we believe that. And we, we believe it just as the Millerites believed it. That is, there really wasn't a lot of difference about what we believe about a pro- close of probation and the second coming than the Millerites believed. But, but they abandoned that near the end, though we took it up again after October 22nd, 1844. And that's why they had um, October 13th as the, as the close of probation before October 22nd, 1844. Not everyone, but many Millerites believed that on the first day of the seventh month, that probation had closed. They weren't preaching the last 10 days uh, before October 22nd, 1844, because the door had closed. There was already a shut door. They didn't shut the door on October 22nd in their thinking. Right? It was already shut. So, so this symbolism here of these open and shut doors, these come from the understanding of the doors of the holy and the most holy place. And we can see the ark is now mentioned here in Revelation eleven nineteen. So we've had uh, the laver, the sea of glass. We've had the holy place itself with the golden lampstand and the table of showbread, which would have been Christ's throne. I didn't make that clear, but Christ's throne is standing before, is before the lampstand, so it must be the table of showbread. And then we had the altar of incense in chapter 8. And now we have the Ark of his Testament. We have all of these symbols, and now this is in connection with the seven trumpets. Now, when we look at the book of Revelation, I mean, different people analyze this book and try to understand it. Um, But I think one of the things that we can see quite clearly is there are these different periods that are represented by seven. Seven churches, the seven seals, the seven trumpets. And all of them are connected to the sanctuary symbolism. They show a progression of understanding the sanctuary message. And, you know, I skipped Revelation chapter 10, of course, because it doesn't, it doesn't have a direct reference, reference to the sanctuary. But it does tie us to Daniel chapter 12. And it does deal with the little book that was opened. And that's that's the portion of the book. That's the portion of the book that was opened with the seven seals. A portion of that is the book of Daniel. It's the little book. It's not the entire book. But it's opened when, when all that history of the Old Testament prophecy is fulfilled. So... In chapter 11, we come to the seventh trumpet, which is going to give us the ark. So now we've looked at all the pieces of furniture. But chapter 12 is going to bring us to a different story. That is, the natural division of the book of Revelation, even though these chapters were put here by man, is there is 11 chapters and another 11 chapters. Where do these 11 and 11 making 22 chapters come from? Anybody know why why God in his providence allowed the book of Revelation to be divided in this way? Go back to our study of the book of Genesis. Isn't this a symbol of restoration? Okay, so it is a symbol of restoration. 22, just like two. 220 is a symbol of restoration. But that symbol comes from somewhere. And we have how many generations to the flood? Ten. Eleven if you're counting Shem and his brothers. Okay. And then how many generations from then do we have until Jacob? 11, isn't it? 22 total generations. Right, there's 22. So it's 11 and 11. 
Now, 1111 is an important symbol. I'm not going to get into all, all these symbols. Um, but we see this in the story of Joseph, for one, right? Remember when Joseph has his two dreams? How many years is it to the dreams of the butler and baker? It's 11. And then how many years more is it to when he's restored again with his brothers? It's another 11. It's 22 years. So there is something about the book of Revelation in its 22 chapters and this natural division that occurs that, that we can't ignore. And that it goes and brings us back to the story of Joseph and also to the first 22 generations. And in those first 22 generations, one of the things we studied and we learned, because this is about the seed of the woman, right? Isn't this, isn't the 22 generations about the seed of the woman, about the promise made in Genesis chapter three? Yes. <clears throat> yes. And, and it's in Revelation 12 verse one that you're going to see that prophecy now being fulfilled. You're going to see the woman and she's going to give birth to this man child. So the, so halfway through the book of Revelation, it's going to bring us to that, that symbol. That's in Genesis chapter 3, verse 15. Now, the other thing about this is um, we have this story of Joseph with the 22 generations. And those 22 generations, when it comes to the seed, the promised seed, each of those 22 generations, what have they, what is, what is it that's different about those first 22 generations than Joseph's generation? The firstborn issue. Okay. So, right. The firstborn. So, that promise is being passed down. The seed of the woman is being passed down through these generations. We're watching that promise. That's the promise of Christ. But when it gets to Jacob, he divides it amongst his 12 sons. And, and so those 12 sons, they don't, they, don't, they don't have the eldest. Reuben doesn't get the double portion and the priesthood and the kingship. No. Yeah, that was awarded to um, Joseph, right? Yeah, Joseph gets the double portion. Judah gets the kingship. Levi gets the priesthood. Yeah, that's what that's what actually kind of threw all that stuff into place was Joseph getting it. Yeah, as opposed to Reuben. Well, not really, because the situation was that what Reuben had done disqualified himself mm -hmm. from receiving any of the blessing. Right. Same thing happened with Simeon. Then it falls next to the next two in line, which were Judah and Levi. But it left the double portion to the oldest of the most favorite wife. Yeah. Yeah. Th this is really important stuff. I mean, the most favorite what? Favorite most wife. favorite wife. Rachel. W-I-F-E. OK. Yeah. Raquel. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. I'm a little deaf. <laughs> you're fine don't worry about that so so you can see that this that, that these things from the old testament that just you know are stories you know to many people they they're clothed with this 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 imagery that ties all of scripture together these promises of god are seen in these stories and 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 of course you know we have the two periods of 11 years, but we have the 22 years. We have that division of those generations before the flood and after the flood. And then we have, again, this division in the book of Revelation of 11 and 22. And it's in Revelation 12 now that we're going to see this being fulfilled. Now, there's a change. We're not going to have these sevens anymore. We're not going to have, you know, seven, seven churches have already happened. Seven seals has happened. Seven trumpets has happened. But now we're going into a different way in which this is represented. And this is going to be um, going to the time of Christ, and it's going to bring us through the 1260 years to the end of that period. 
And so it's bringing us to Millerite history. That's what the last part of Revelation is about. The second half is really about Millerite history, even though it covers the 1260. It covers the 1260 because it's concerned about the end of it. Now, this is really the study for next week. I really want to go and examine Revelation 12, the beast in it, Revelation 13, the beasts there, and Revelation 17 and the beasts, and then see how that all ties up into the close of the book of Revelation, what this is about. But one of the things we know is that we look at these beasts, the great red dragon with seven heads, ten horns, seven crowns upon his head. We look at the beast in Revelation 13, you know, with um, the composite beast, right? It has the different characteristics of the beast of Daniel chapter 7. But it doesn't have seven crowns or, or um, seven crowns on its heads. It has ten horn crowns upon its ten horns. So there's differences. And in, in Revelation 17, it doesn't have any crowns. It has received no kingdom as, as of yet. And, and so we kind of always think of these, at least I used to, as sort of just the same beast. But they're not. Great Red Dragon, that's pagan Rome. Revelation 13, that's papal Rome. And the beast at the end, which with the woman riding it, is the kingdoms of this world at the end of time. And, and so we're going to see that. Now, I do want to touch a little bit on this woman, because this is Revelation 12, the Revelation 12 sign prophecy, and which I've mentioned many, many times, but 777 days before November 9th, 2019, this false prediction using this time prophecy made by evangelicals where they believe the rapture was going to happen on September 23rd, 27, and that there would be 1260 days of the plagues falling out upon the earth or whatever was they thought were going to happen. Different evangelical groups have different interpretations. But this was a false prediction but it fit into our time and it, it actually opened up the fact that July 18th was meant to be a failed prediction. And, and so, you know, the revelation 12 sign it, it's in my papers. I'm not going to go through it right now, but I think it's important to look at in the context of where it occurs in Re revelation 12, because we know, Who's this woman? Revelation 12, one. Who's the woman? Well, it's a church. It's a church. It's not Mary, right? No. But it's also a representation of the sky, right? Because she's clothed with the sun. She has the moon under her feet. She has a crown of 12 stars upon her head, right? And there's a great red dragon, you know, seeking to uh, devour the child. And, and this can be seen in the sky on September 23rd, 2017. But this is really about the birth of Christ. So the question is, why does this literally happen in heaven in our time, in an hour line? Is Christ wanting to be born again in his people at the end of time? Yes. He wants to be represented in his people. At this right. Time. Right. So we need to be born again. We need to have the character of Christ. His character needs to be seen upon us. The church has to give birth to Christ. And the great red dragon is seeking to destroy us. So, so we know we can look at the past history of prophecy and we can see that it's typifying what happens at the end. That is, God declares the end from the beginning. This is the beginning of the Christian church. It has to typify the end of the Christian church. Now, the fact that our movement has experienced these times, these dates, this structure, God has been working in our lives in this movement in a way that it, to me it's it's remarkable 
that we can be in this time of history, but we are. And it's an extremely serious matter. And we can't look at what's happening this weekend as something trivial, nor what's going to happen next week or the week after, because we have to be diligent. We have to be sober because our enemy goeth about as a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. He did it as a dragon in the time of Christ, and he's seeking to do it again now. We have to watch our gar- We have to watch. We have to wash our garments. We have to watch for Christ. We can't be playing a game with religion. We can't just be interested in this because it 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 feeds our intellect or our pride or some kind of something in our flesh, whatever that is, it has to actually destroy us, this truth. So <clears throat> that's where we are for today in this study. Good question? Yeah. Um, you recall the, I think it was two studies ago, You mm-hmm. uh, for the first 20 minutes before the study, you had a, display of the this revelation 12 um, description of the yeah. sun and moons and the stars was that actually what we're looking at here in the sky today is that what you're no. saying no that was on september 23rd 2017 that's what we saw in the sky oh, okay september right. 23rd so, yeah um, and that was in 2017, you said? Yeah, that was in 2017. Here's what the sky looked like on September 23rd. I got to go back. So um, I got to go back. I'm going ahead in time. So let's go back. Yeah, 24th, 23rd. So what you see here. I'm not, I'm not seeing anything. Oh, you're not? That's because I didn't share it properly. Just hang on. Um, Got to do this share again. So. Oh, there it is. So what you're going to see, I just got to get moving a bit better. Um, So when you look at the sky, I don't have the ground here. I just have the sky. So this is the woman. She's got clothed with the sun. She has the moon under her feet. There's a crown of 12 stars. So there's nine stars in Regulus. uh, And then there's three planets here, Mercury, Mars, and Venus. And she also has Jupiter. Now, Somebody had asked about this. Well, Jupiter, what's Jupiter have to do with anything? Well, Jupiter is a symbol. So we have to look at these things as symbols. And Jupiter had spent nine months in the woman. That is, Jupiter moved um, in, the, in the womb, uh, moved, and it went in retrograde. So it, it went, went in, circled around, and then came back out. And it comes out here at this time. This is also Rosh Hashanah, the first day of the seventh month on the biblical calendar. And and this here is just almost sunset. So you you wouldn't, once the sun sets, then you would see uh, the virgin. You wouldn't see it during the day uh, because the sun's there. But, um, But that's what you see. So the sun in September is in Virgo, right, the virgin. And that's that true every September, but you don't have Mercury, Venus, and Mars with the nine stars above her head. And you don't have it. You always do have at some point in September um, that you're going to have the moon under her feet. That is the moon. This would be the new moon. Right. It looks like a full moon, but it's actually, it's just so you can see it's the moon, but it would actually be a crescent moon um, that you would have seen the night before. So it actually be the night before that we would look at this, not this Who moment. picked up on this? Well, this has been something that's been around for a long time. Uh, it, like it goes back hundreds of years, but it, 
um, we've only had the technology that people could really look at this. Some people try to get the birth of Christ um, using this sign in the time of Christ when he was born. They try to use this to determine when he was born. So this this is old. but So it's a reoccurring element of the way the stars move? Yes, but not exactly in this way. That having Jupiter in the womb of the woman? No. So you can have the moon and the sun and the three planets. That does occur occasionally. Like, not like every four years or anything like that. Like hundreds of years. But, but to have the Jupiter in her womb for nine months, that's something that's not very... I, I would have never picked up on that in a million years. Yeah. Well, I wouldn't have either. I mean, the thing that was funny about it is when I started looking at these um, Mayan calendar and I came to that failed prediction, I think it was Stephen who pointed it out to me that because I was talking about 777 days before November 9th when I was presenting July 18th at Lambert Church as the symbol of the prediction before midnight. He said, well, that's this failed prophecy. So I think it was Stephen who knew about this. He knows about all these kinds of things. So uh, and now I had heard of it. I, I wouldn't have known the date, but he knew the date. So, so and I'm pretty sure it was Stephen. I don't think it was Abdili. I was pretty sure it was Stephen who told me of it. So this then, is actually a wonderful way of presenting what we're talking about at that point. Or right now, I mean. Yeah, but we have to recognize it's it's a false prophecy. That is, it's a failed prediction. But God uses it to say something to this movement about our July 18th prediction. Because the Mayan calendar is connected to ours, our prediction, but it's a failed prediction. September 23rd is connected by 777 days to November 9th. It's a failed prediction. So is November 9th a failed prediction? Yeah, so well, that's, that's exactly like the Millerites. They had failed prediction after failed prediction as well, right? Yes, they did, which which is one of the things I try to point out that um, some of the people at FA, FFA didn't like. That's why they cut us off on December 6th, because they didn't want to hear that. They wanted this to be the end of all this nonsense about dates and times and predictions. They wanted just to go back to regular Adventism of some sort. You know, maybe a conservative Adventism, but nothing about predictions because they're too embarrassed. But the reality is the Millerites made a lot of failed predictions. But they still persisted because God was leading them. And the same with us. God is leading us. And I'm not saying we're going to make more predictions regarding time because I don't believe that we can. But we have to recognize that God was leading us and that he showed us before July 18th that it would be a failed prediction. And we can't ignore that. Well, he did say that, I mean, we did attach a disappointment to this. I mean, it's, it's yes. And, some and, people just can't accept the disappointment right. that actually happened. <laughs> mm -hmm. and, and remember that Jeff, he compared us to Abraham offering up Isaac. Does Abraham kill Isaac or is his hand stayed? His hand was stayed. He compared us to Jonah prior to July 18th. Why was he He's... comparing us to Jonah? Was he <laughs> expecting a failed prediction? Well, uh, Jonah wasn't really a failed prediction as much as by what we determined that he was the greatest preacher in the, uh, in the <laughs> Bible to be able to convert the whole of Nineveh not but, necessarily a failed prediction and, and again with the july or the july 18th uh prediction um it went out in such a manner could it have actually happened that way uh, I, I, I if we so. wouldn't have said if we wouldn't have said a thing you know i mean it, it, i, I would have i couldn't have lived with myself right and and that's why jeff brought it up he just said we have to do this we have to warn nineveh right right i mean, I mean we have to do it I'm sorry, it didn't take a, a, a whale or a, a giant fish to spit us up on a shore, but, you know, it was pretty much the same. It kind of felt like it. I mean, we were, we were being carried along by this vessel um, mm -hmm. to deliver this message, no matter 
I mean, it was compelling the hearts of all. I mean, I was sitting there listening to all of this. Yeah, and we didn't want to preach time, did we? No, <laughs> that was not the, that was not the, that we were so why, against it. it. It was made waves with everybody. Yeah, so why don't we want to preach time? Why did we not want to preach time? Uh, because of Ellen White's statement. No, that's not why. Embarrassment. Well, yeah, Adventists that would be are embarrassed the primary motivator by the disappointment, right? They're disappointed. They're embarrassed by 1844. They are. You can't have a disappointment without doing something, without <laughs> expecting something. Well, that's what. The, so they just say we're, you know, we don't know when Jesus is going to come back. This way, we can never be disappointed. Re well, really, we can't be embarrassed by the world. And that was. I was never part. embarrassed about it. I was just yeah. uh, uh, a little taken back about yeah. the whole thing but i was never embarrassed about it mm -hmm. okay well thank you for that that question let's close with prayer <clears throat> dear father in heaven we are thankful that you have allowed us to understand um your word at least as much as we do and we are thankful lord that you entrusted us to give a warning to nashville that you have emboldened us to continue to persist in the things that you have taught us. And we ask, Lord, that you can be with us throughout this Sabbath. Give us rest spiritually, mentally, physically, and help us cling to you no matter what happens. Thank you for hearing our prayer. Be with each person, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. <clears throat>